Recording is on. Hey, so who's here? Hey, uh, Miles is here. And Nathan's here. Awesome. I don't know where Marchin is. Has anybody been able to get a hold of him today? Mm, I got an email from him like around four. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> four. For Japanese time, um, about about an hour ago, but uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I haven't heard, yeah. I, okay, good. So he should be here then. Cool. No details after that. Yeah. Awesome. Do you guys have you guys have the link to the current meeting um slides? Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, is anyone recording this? I'm recording. Nice. Um, did it work last time to record it? Yes, yes, it did. I used the J the Jitsi thing and I record. I preset it. I have to always fiddle with my Dropbox first. It goes to Dropbox and I'm willing to deal with all that. Nice. Okay. So so I've posted I've posted um, the last couple of meetings on the devlog page. Yeah. Okay. So I don't I don't know how to get those onto your YouTube, but obviously feel free. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, and they're on um, they're on Dropbox currently, or where are they? Yeah, I have them on Dropbox. It should be set to open share. I think you can download them and then re-upload okay. them to your YouTube if that's better for you. And I'll, I also. I'll do them. I also found a couple meetings from October that are um, where I'd recorded. I found them in the Dropbox, and so those are um, those are stashed under the October on the wiki. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll uh, I'll put them on the OSC. Uh, download them and put them in. So one one good news here, if you've heard to the grapevine, 
finally there's one gig internet in the area and we're getting that installed currently it's going to be online in about 30 days or so so we're going to actually have real bandwidth uh coming up pretty soon so that's going to be good um i'm going to restart my camera here Um, excellent. So let's take a look at the, um, yeah, welcome everybody. So I'm kind of joining Happy New Year to everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, can, can maybe we start by just summarizing what happened in the last uh, meeting or two? Can, can somebody, uh, Jen, I know you did a hackathon just, just to fill me in, um, and, and summarize for the, for the world, I know I can miss them, and you guys got the notes. But if, if we can just no, the, a second, the hackathon went really well. I wasn't, I didn't do a project because I wasn't really prepared to do a project like that. But I interfaced with a lot of people and generated a lot of interest and mm -hmm. have ideas for how to make the next one run really smoothly. I've got some notes on that, but um, we don't need to start with that. And most of the last meeting was talking about ways to break down the different projects into effective things for the hackathon. And then mm -hmm. um, Chaz, who I want to say is in Minnesota, but it might be Michigan, um, a, was listening. He used to be a builder, I think, with OSE. And he was he he was he joined the meeting and then he talked about his um, press, I want to say CVC press, something, he talked about his projects. And then we got into a big conversation about scale models and how scale models would be an interesting project, like for coding, for you know, for scaling them down. They'd yeah. be good for toys, they'd be good for demonstrating, they'd be good for practicing building. A lot of the benefits of scale models. And yeah. um I think I think that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. 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 Scale models are something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Now, do we have anybody taking notes for this? Can somebody take notes? Do we have a note-taking volunteer? I know Abe's been doing it. He was wonderful. Is that Abe? Abe. Okay. I can try. Let's talk about scale models first. Let's start with that. So I've got my agenda. I've got update on. Uh, I've been working on a brick press, actually, a new controller on that. And then uh, the 3D printer installing the the omnidirectional fan shroud. That's that's what we've got. Um, but let's start with uh, I'm going to type that in there. Scale models because um, it's one of those things. And let's see, just uh, who who all do we have today so that we can kind of judge the timing for today? Because I want to update on the brick press and maybe scale models and the and the latest on the 3d printer uh who else we got uh, reporting today miles is here miles okay i will have that'll be great um miles okay who else we got i know we got eric any updates from eric or Um, I'm here attending. Uh, I haven't been deep into anything lately, but uh, okay. uh, I am going to be presenting in a few months um, the 3D printer uh, here at MSU. So I need to get that up. Oh, nice, nice. And then talking about 3D printer, uh, you've got, you still have the, um, on your printer, you've got, when you were here, the Prusai 3 MK2, MK2 extruder, which we could not get that thing to work without re uh, with retraction. I don't know if you followed that conversation. So it works reasonably well when when we disable retraction in it. So you get a little bit of kind of like these uh, these st stringing artifacts. Uh, it works. I would actually suggest upgrading to the latest greatest. I mean, if you've got a hundred bucks for an authentic uh, E3D extruder, which is what we use in the current version, the E3D titan arrow extruder which for us our sake is positive in a sense of it works very well with flexible filaments as well as normal filaments 
that's the preferred choice and we're really going with that because i you know i don't know like if if uh john uh is going to succeed with any of that and and i know that reading through internet forums there definitely were problems with prusa 3 mk2 extruders as far as reliability and they, they do have a new extruder that's pretty much custom so he can't really get it off the shelf but the the titan arrow by e3d is one of the best if not the best i mean i guess that's kind of the industry standard for highest quality extruder that also lulzbot uses and we like lulzbot because they're all open source and collaborating with us uh in fact for the titan arrow the omnidirectional fan shroud guess what i did i just uh downloaded the design from lulzbot from the lulzbot mini 2 printer uh in freecad native freecad because those guys are real and they they use freecad uh for their designs so if you go to on the wiki to the uh let's see 3d printer extruder i'll guide you through that page because that's if you want to take a look at that uh, I put that in the chat box. 3D printer extruder. If you want to take a look at that, uh, if you go to part library there and scroll down the underslung extruder, uh, the first is a full CAD file. And then let me share my screen here for you guys to... You guys want to take a look at that so the 3d printer extruder page on the on the wiki and the index go to part library under strong under slung extruder uh full files there so you see the tight narrow and the the um, fan shroud look at that crazy thing so i took that from lowell's bot and modified it to mount it on the existing on the same universal access system that we have, so it's pretty nice and tight. And the picture there that you see in um, the first in the in the gallery there, that's what the actual thing looks like. So it looks pretty tight. Uh, it's got the fan shroud with the fan blowing. It's got the large sensor there, and the Titan arrow as the cornerstone of that. And now the carriage because of the flexibility of the universal axis the carriage could be uh, vertically oriented or it can be horizontally oriented because the bolt mounting holes on the carriages can you can attach things both ways so it's got that four bolt pattern but anyway the actual picture of what that looks like would clearly be under d3d genealogy so if you look at um I know it's called D3D V18.12 because I did this in December here. So if you go to the D3D V18.12 page on the wiki, you can see actual pictures of the machine of the extruder as built. Um, and if you go to the workshops page, you probably see some pictures of the actual printer with a thing mounted. Uh, so you can take a look at that, but that's kind of like the latest thing and you see the same carriage and then the whole extruder assembly mounts on a carriage and now using the standard uh, triangular like the it's called the mount bracket using that right now. So using the stock mounting bracket that attaches kind of clamps around our carriage. So you can see the take a look at the FreeCAD file. You can unravel that uh, whole assembly if you want to take a look at the latest and then um it's kind of a sandwich that clamps over the over the the carriage piece uh you can see the sensor holder and yeah it works it works well uh, i can say the print quality is pretty good definitely going the uh, getting the blowing the co print cooling from all the directions so um now if flows but mini's got uh, some of the highest. If you look at the ratings of Lulzbot Mini 2 uh, and Make Magazine last year was like third place or so or very much near the top of ratings of like 20 top 3D printers. So the print quality is really high using this style of extruder. Okay, so that's the update 
on a 3D printer. Um, right now, there's a workshop happening. So I'm, I'm, there's a Kansas Highland uh, Community College in Kansas. So that's happening on February 12th. Just today, received some communications from people in New Orleans where we might be running a workshop soon after in New Orleans. And there's some other stuff happening in Europe in terms of uh, some teachers, t potentially che teacher training that will be in the Nether Netherlands if that goes through. And the guys from Canada, there's, there's Russ Purvis who's working on a, on a build, getting the basically sourcing the materials in Canada right now so I can do a build up there. Uh, for about 12 printer builds in Canada. So there's there's a bunch of stuff going on and trying to really develop that to the final completion. I mean, it's kind of been slow over the Christmas. And now that um, I must update on the brick press, let's go into that because that's kind of uh, take took me a little bit uh, off track on the brick press in, sense, in the sense that so Scott Mader, who bought the, ver the, the brick press a couple of years ago, he never picked it up here since we used it for the CD home build, so it's actually still here. And I'm adding a new controller on that. And I want to just talk a little bit about that. So look at numbers, slide number seven. Uh, so this is what we have right now. That's the brick press actually without the hopper. Uh, that's when we were using it to make some bricks for the CD home, some of the floor bricks and some thermal wall bricks. Uh, but yeah, we, we'd be getting seven bricks per minute there. So. Uh, historically speaking, we used the controller that used MOSFETs. Um, so basically, you got your Arduino brain uh, activating, MOS, activating MOSFETs to run solid, hydraulic solenoids, the things that switch the hydraulic power on and off, the hydraulic fluid. Uh, so right now, we're simplifying that greatly. Um, before, we used the custom board. And now, I don't know what happened a long time ago when maybe that cut, that relay shield for arduino did not exist but we went with a custom board before and it's like man that was so much harder so right now we're using an arduino a custom a simple custom board um simple non-custom board a, a simple shield that mounts right on top of the arduino on page eight uh so that mounts on top of the arduino and that switches the the solenoid solenoids the hydraulic solenoids which are your 2,000 or 3,000 PSI hydraulic pressure switching solenoids, as you see on page nine there. So that's the actual breakdown of the hydraulic valve detail, uh, more details about the switch. But man, the system is very simple. Like if you look at uh, page eight, you've got the Arduino, you connect that to power, you connect the shield on top of the Arduino through the headers directly, and then you just plug in one plug that holds the selector switch dupont connector so that the headers there on the on top of the the shield you've got a pressure sensor and a selector switch through this 10 pin header so just basically one plug into that very little custom wiring no custom board uh, all off the shelf materials the relay shield is only like eight bucks on amazon the selector switch is 10 the most expensive part there is the pressure switch which costs about 35 dollars um it's a high pressure 2000 to three, like 1500 to 3000 psi uh pressure switch for the brick press so that's what's going on there and what i'll probably do is end up printing a nice enclosure for that where this mounts simply in a small enclosure that's 3d printed and then Abe and I were talking about Abe looking into little LCD displays that can plug into this Arduino so that we can have a brick counter display. So we want to get the longevity of the machine data, like uh, see, see how many bricks we press, thousands of bricks. So that's good. Now, this brick press is going right now uh, to Florida, actually, because that's where Scott is living right now. And we've considered actually doing a I mean, we're, we were looking, we are looking into a build in Florida, but we know that of a CB house, so a small demo house. And now Katarina is actually back in business. She's designing a brick, small version of the CD Eco home with brick CBs. Um, we're looking at the possibility of Florida. If Florida doesn't work out because they have some of the strictest hurricane codes there, which means that would add significant costs to the, to the build. Uh, but we are considering either Florida or Belize. So Belize might be in November. Now we're still looking at October for the Utah build of uh, another guy there who has our brick press, um, also a friend of Scott's. So Scott's kind of been 
seminal in, in this funding the brick press work here because he's he's bought two of these machines one is in utah and this one is still a factory farm here but uh, that's the kind of the schedule we're looking at a build late in the year so we can get back to the uh, the house builds so that's where we are on the brick press and that's the 3d printer update one thing i did want to talk about scale models because um if we talk about OSC clubs, so we do have our London International Academy. There's William there who's currently working on a, on a cordless drill. Now, what he's doing is quite interesting. He's going to open source the, there's that open, uh, not open source 3D printed electric motor, the 600 watt one. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, Google uh, 3D printed um, electric motor. Uh, he's going to open source that for the cordless drill. So that's actually really cool. It's going to be 3D printed with magnets. It's got uses magnetic PLA for the core around which the magnets go. So it's if we can open source a nice, decent performance 3D printed electric motor, that would be a great contribution. Now William is working on that for the cordless drill. That's great stuff. T let's talk about scale models. For any of the machines, like uh, this occurred to me for the brick press right now, because why not print? First of all, you can print, of course, this, the thing in miniature, and you can print it in the sections just like we cut it out of steel. Like the steel um, sections, there are no steel sections outside of the tubing for the legs because it's all cut out of flat steel. So we can 3D print the flat pieces. Uh, and we can also simulate the assembly of how this machine would go together. So say that would be a, a great student project, you know, with uh, OSC clubs or something where we can 3D print the individual parts and then just glue them together. They're kind of notched, so you know how, you know how, but glue them together and, and you can document at scale, at a scale model, how the thing goes together. Now, what about adding the controller and the active elements like the hydraulics? Well, why not take a small 50 PSI hydraulic, not hydraulic, water, water pump, like a small diaphragm water pump, 12 volt, use that to pump water and 3D print your cylinder. So you can see some online, you can find 3D printed uh, water cylinders. And there you could have the actual motion elements of the brick press using a small water pump. So hydraulics, while we run them at 3,000 or 2,000 PSI for the real machines, you can run it at small pressure, like 50 PSI, and, and run small components that run with water. So it would be safe for kids to play with that or safe for prototyping during hackathons. So that would be excellent. Now, you can do that for the brick press for any of the hydraulic machines. So like prototyping the tractor or anything else, that could be a whole realm of activity that can happen along with the real machine development. So, so there could be a whole function of people, whole, whole team of people working on the scale models, which would be an exciting contribution that eventually does contribute to the real builds. And the people who build the scale models would be qualified to, to actually um, go the next step and do the full scale machines. Now, the advantage of the scale models is you can also do the electronics, like the whole controller scheme. You can test that out on a scale model. You can have the small washer solenoids that could activate the water. You can have a small pressure sensor. Those are all inexpensive off-the-shelf components. So there's point being, there's a lot that can be done with the scale models. So I would encourage that discussion. and. Maybe open that up to discussion. What are the thoughts on that? Like, Jen, is there a way to um, to do that? Now, Jen, I wanted to find out more. The hackathon that you're talking about, is that something that you plugged into that already existed, or is this something that you created? I plugged into it, and I'm right at the beginning. It's, I got in on, like, their second or third hackathon, and I'm invited on the outro. Everybody's excited about the project. Mm -hmm. I just need to have a good um, hackable bite-sized chunk for the next one so I can get people working on a team. They even bring in, um, they don't call them scrum lords, I don't know, facilitators to help yeah. uh, keep the team on track because they don't expect all the project leaders to be, um, you know, facile with that. But 
All I need to all yeah. I need a project, something something uh finite. Yeah. And homeschool oh, Bobby will never be homeless again. I uh, yeah, right. So, um I sign up for all these free classes and that's how I found the hackathon too. Like, you know, there's always like the coat, there's like four or five coding dojos in Seattle. And I, um, one of them got back to me to find out if I was interested in taking courses. And I talked about like the stuff I'm working on and that it didn't seem like there were any courses that were really applicable to what I needed. Cause nobody does any blockchain stuff. And that's what really what I want to learn about. But I pointed out that if their graduates needed something that they could um, work on, so that they could commit gifts and such like and stay active in the community until they get um, hired, that they should consider our project. And she actually got pretty excited about that. So that would be a good way to get people on the team would be to interface with various um, coding schools. Yeah. Um, yeah that would be. Now, coding they, schools, like, are they interested in stuff like like simple Arduino stuff? Yeah, there were people there were people talking about Arduino and that's one of the choices on the um, hack for democracy thing on yeah. you know, do we need people for this? Do we, you know, what do we need people for? Absolutely. And it's OK. And so two things that employers are looking for here are actually they're looking for committed gifts, which, you know, that goes to our need for people to document. They need commit. They're, they're looking for committed gets and they're looking for open source work. They're like, did this person volunteer on any projects? Are they really actually interested in what they're doing? These are yeah. so they're perfect. Yeah, no, that's great. So I, I would say like the, the brick press, it is a low hanging fruit because out of this could also come out an education kit. So we create this and it serves both to teach people during the build of it about coding. Like once they get to the mm -hmm. actual components and 3D printing, and then we could end up packaging that as a kit for education and like dev kit, you know, like, okay, say you want to develop new functions for the CB press, right? Here's the code. Here's the scale model. Go ahead and do the modifications. And we'll uh, build it yeah. You don't have to right. build the big thing to work on the code. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Like if somebody had the scale model, like I wouldn't have to do that right here. Like we, we could uh, outsource or work as a team. Uh, so then somebody actually tests and verify the code, then, then I can go into my real brick press right now, download it, and it would probably work, you know? So you get you get those scale you get those scale models out to the homeschool kids and you're gonna have eight year olds fixing all this stuff for us. Absolutely. And that's that's kind of the way I'm thinking. Like if we get the fast internet here, I was thinking along the lines of uh, preparing so so by the way, I am definitely spending time on a book and, and writing writing some of the getting my head around writing the book because I do believe writing the book on open source ecology after a decade of work here is important to align the community and, and get a clear direction. Now, um, part of that, I was thinking develop a course like a online course where we, we train people for various development work where the prototyping and the scale models could be a part of that. So imagine getting a whole bunch of OSC clubs started out of that where we kind of get the, get the ball going. So yes, uh, definitely huge potential for school uh, schools, and that could plug into the real prototyping program as well. So definitely uh, worth worth trying. For the brick press, what I would suggest. So we do have all the files, like as far as what we built from the the last build was 2017. That was uh, the machine that went off to Utah, actually. Um, but that was 2017. You can look at the CB Press genealogy on a wiki. You can download the latest DXF files, which are the two-dimensional cutting files. And you can pretty much from that, if you you can download the files and just print them out, extrude them, print them out. So first of all, from the 2D, you'd have to extrude them to the third dimension, which because they have a finite yeah. dimension, like there's half-inch steel. Um, so say when you, you, you scale that down, say a factor of or that means instead of a half inch, the, the piece of metal, the little scale model thing would be like, say, an eighth inch. And a quarter scale model is something that's realistically doable. Um, if you do one quarter scale, actually one sixth scale would be ideal because that means that the, the machine itself is the longest elements there are six feet long. So if you do a one sixth scale model, that means the largest member is now one foot long and that could fit on a print bed, like say our one foot D3D or some other printer that can print one foot. 
Uh, so that'll be usable. Uh, right now, it's e it's process will be to download the files, print them out, start building it together. And now the thing that we have to figure out is, okay, how exactly do you do the cylinder? So you have to pretty much open source that. There's there's some models on Thingiverse, but we have to pretty much design one that's our particular size, 3D printed. And the way it typically works is you'd have the in order for water not to leak in there, you have rubber O-rings around the piston. So yeah, once you get to the cylinder part, you can look at the details of how a cylinder is made. But it's essentially a piston, like a like a needle plunger, you know, like a hypodermic needle kind of deal. It's a plunger that press it up and down. There's fluid that just gets pushed in and out. It's essentially all it is. Now, what you want to do if you use 3D printing is you could either print the O-ring or you could get it off the shelf. And for the smooth surfaces, it would be easy to use PVC pipe, like say one inch PVC pipe uh, to provide a smooth surface for the cylinder to, to actually work. You can also 3D print it, but you have to have really fine resolution. So it'd be a long, longer print uh, while there is an easy option of taking PVC pipe, which is a few cents for, you know, a few inches for a, a cylinder. So that wouldn't be a big cost. So it's so combining like off the shelf PVC with 3D printed cylinder ends and things like that, et cetera. So um, I would say, Jen, I mean, go on, go ahead and propose that. I can see all the files and if you can do that, that would be awesome. So, um, and, and what, when is the next time that you're meeting with the people? The next the hackathon is March 16th. And okay. um, I'm hoping to get some, like they provide the paper, you know, for everybody to write their projects on. But I would mm -hmm. like to have, since it's an ongoing thing and I'm sure there'll be other opportunities to present for open source ecology, I would like to actually invest in some sort of classy assets to hang for us when we do these things. Yeah. I haven't had yeah. a chance to look around and see what's available. I'm thinking um, get like the OSE logo printed on a larger dry erase format so that you know there there is room to write in extra things where needed but yeah to have something that look you know it, it i cannot tell you how much our professional website and wiki helps and just the fact that we have ted talks because people are kind of like ah blah oh that's like this oh that's like that and i just say hey we have ted talks and you yeah, know right. we do plural right and they're like oh i like ted talks and then i you know stick them on the ose ted talk and hand them back their phone <laughs> yeah yeah, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, excellent. So let's keep moving on here. So um, let's see. Who else? Uh, who's next? Who wants to report? And Jen, I mean, of course, ask me questions if you need any other resources to prepare for the hackathon. Next. Uh, Abe, I want to ask you, Abe, Abe, are you on there? Yeah, you are. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, is slide five still the, the latest, like as far as the clamp holders for like the PVC version of D3D? Um, what was the status of that, the latest? Let's see, the CAD on the uh, clamps for the PVC? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't. Let's see. I, I keep meaning to get back to more CAD. At least I keep saying that because uh, I do think that there's lots of CAD that's important to do, and it's hard to find people to work on CAD. So, I've kind of been one of the few people doing that. I, I haven't worked on the the PVC printer stuff in a while. I think that the see, as I recall, the the clamp I think was pretty good the design there and I was trying to finish the assembly sub assemblies and assembly of the whole printer, which was, um, it, it was a little, uh, difficult just fitting all those sub assemblies together. Let's see, that's, that's mm -hmm. an older photo you're looking at there, but yeah, I think it was a, was, did I end up with a two piece clamp? I think, I think is what we showed before, right? It was, yeah, I think so. It's two bolts. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's one of those things I need to get back with. And I was hoping, uh, I think John, I think, suggested different points. I think he was in one of the last meetings, or at least there was, I think, messages or something I saw on his log. He was hoping to get back to working on his PVC 3D printer. I think it's pretty close. I think he suggested to being 
uh, put together. So, so mm -hmm. to hear uh, more information about that and how that works. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And um, other than the three D printer, what else? Um, anything else on your side, Abe? Uh, so the green general, control, like, um, so what you just to update on that. So basically, a logger for for temperature and humidity, or what, what's what's all in your greenhouse controller? Also turning things on, like water. I started um, <laughs> that project kind of a few years ago, hoping to uh, utilize it just to kind of check temperatures with some cheap sensors and so on, and you know, just a box of different electronics, Arduino stuff from from Adafruit or something, and. Uh, I, I think I finally solved some bugs on it. I'd kind of mostly been working on it in the winter occasionally, and so I'd get kind of lost on that. But it, I think I've solved some of the major issues recently. So, but but I'm also thinking I need to change to different hardware because when I started it, I didn't have Wi-Fi or wireless or internet really here. So, and now now I think wireless would be helpful. So I may um, eventually get around to getting a. Wireless almost re always requires a more advanced uh, board, uh, a different microcontroller. Probably, um, I think the uh, what is it? The MKR one thousand. I think was a good one with Wi-Fi, but they're they're different. They're more advanced, and so there's different considerations. But it, and that's kind of why. Uh, w with the information Jim was talking about the hackathon, uh, what I think it is could use, you know, maybe like a, there's a lot of libraries that are open out there. Um, some of these LCDs and things we're looking at uh, for different projects. I'm not sure that the boards are open. And then, I'm, you know, some of the software is just totally unlicensed for some of those LCDs. But then I looked and I found open source libraries or licenses that looked, you know, acceptable uh, for some of those things. So they exist if you, you hunt around. But uh, connecting all of those different libraries together for some of these more complex, you know, microcontroller projects. It's like we could probably use some people to code uh, and, and at least organize more on the wiki, maybe a big project page with, uh, you know, all the libraries, kind of like a parts library, but software libraries that are open that can be used. Um, I noticed that, that Marlin, I think it, it kind of, a lot of software to simplify things, there's a bunch of different versions of possible boards, like with that that RepRap LCD kit. Uh, there's multiple possible versions of chips and and different versions of that board. Maybe I th at least that's what I think I'm seeing in the software there. So sometimes you know they just make the software so that it can identify the different chips and work with multiple boards. But that has complexity and uh, there's a lot of different projects. I know I think you've got a you met a wiki page recently about a universal microcontroller sort of design. So that some of these uh, people, hackers, I guess, with the, the hackathon stuff could could maybe work on, uh, you know, organizing libraries and making libraries that, that can help uh, make it easier uh, to work with kind of putting the libraries together. I don't know if you'd call that like an API, but um, there's almost always a need to to interface multiple libraries together, even if they're already in existence and open source. It, it can be a little more complicated to write the code using all of them together. So there's a need for that. Um, yeah, so I've been kind of in software mode um, and and other hardware stuff lately. But and I, I think there's a lot of possibilities for FreeCAD software too, right? Because we talked about workbenches before. Uh, open SCAD, I mean, we really need people to do CAD and I keep meaning, meaning to learn more Open SCAD because I think it's useful for a bunch of things. So software people, maybe they're not familiar with Open SCAD, but maybe there'll be some people that are interested in learning that because that would probably be <laughs> more helpful. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of projects, software, um, I was trying to tell what the status of Risk Five is because that's a big open thing that seems to be getting very popular, which is great. But I'm not sure I understand the openness of like Sci Five. I don't think their Arduino compatible board is necessarily all that open. 
and it's it's still expensive, but it's a more advanced board, so it's hard to compare. But I, I think some of the software stuff they use to make the hardware is somewhat, it seems to have open source license, but I'm not sure that the board is open source either itself. I, it was hard to tell. I didn't do an in-depth analysis, but I saw other projects that were trying to open, uh, I think, RISC-V processors. So, and there's lots of areas you could direct people to work on software if that's what they want to do. Uh, so, but CAD stuff would be great. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done for free CAD, I think, to make it work better because doing assemblies and sub-assemblies, I think, is the hardest thing right now. I mean, it's pretty easy to teach people to do parts and stuff like that, but a lot of times getting, you know, all of that organized together is, is the harder part in free CAD. Thank you, everybody took lots Thank of notes on that. Yeah, I think I think that kind of covers it. I hope. I, uh, yeah, it's a, a we could use a, a wiki page for software stuff, and we'll just list things for people to do. Um, I was kind of meaning to to make something. I, I think I, I'm not hearing Martin. Is anybody else hearing Martin? I see him talking. Oh no, I don't hear Martin. Are you muted? It's booting my mic off. Can people hear me now? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yeah, I was gladly talking to myself, but uh, there's a page called. Uh, getting involved on a wiki and in it you can feel free to jot down some concrete ideas on code work so that so you know there's different realms of engagement there but yeah for coding if we could write down some explicit things now is that that, that page is open for edits so abe feel free to put the code any of the coding notes as far as what's what's important right now uh like for example getting the brick counter added to the uh, brick press controller. That's that'll be cool. That should be an easy thing. Things like that. Okay. Um, next, let's keep going then. Um, Miles, can you tell us a little bit more? I, I was looking at the DC DC converter stuff, and um, I saw this also this instructable on the buck boost converter. DC DC converter. Uh, any thoughts on that, or uh, Miles, uh, update us where you're at. Uh, yeah, so I simplified the the main circuit just for the first prototype to just use one switch and a diode and to use a 555 timer to get a really fast switching like 2.5 to 3 megahertz and other than that it's the same concept as, the, as before. Um, yeah, is that that's not on slide 13 is it? Oh, no, yes. that is, that is. Um, okay, do you need that fast of a switching frequency? Is that uh, like megahertz rate? Yeah, it just depends on how how much you want to change the voltage by. Uh huh. Okay, and what do you think about this? Um, can we drive the MOSFET directly with Arduino? Uh, I think it. Uh, in the the example that you posted to use that P channel, so that could work, but the P channel MOSFETs seem to be a bit slower and they have a bit more resistance. It wouldn't be; it would still be less than a watt of, uh -huh. of energy lost. But yeah, if would you didn't want, exploring? it could be depending on how much how much you want to change the voltage by. Uh, because you could you could change it. Like if you had a lower frequency, you wouldn't be able to change the voltage by as much with the same size inductor, but maybe you, you don't need to. Aha, uh -huh. the faster the frequency, the mm, the smaller inductor you can use. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, do you have any of these components already sourced, or that's is that like your next step? Or I have a 
partial bill of materials. I can post that on. And as far as the what I pointed to the at the end there, is that like what I pointed to? Can we measure here directly with Arduino? Is that the voltage measurement for feedback? That's what that's feedback there. Yeah. Can we just measure that with Arduino without uh, the op amp? You could. I'm just not sure how much the uh, the input resistance of the Arduino is, and so I just put the op amp in there to be a buffer. It's only twenty cents, so. I uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. And that's like a tiny. That's like a little chip, like a thing with like eight pins or something, or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that could be cool. Um, so, what's the limit? So it's it's um. 30 amp max current or like the voltage okay the voltage rating is determined by what which components fry if you go higher so th it would be the capacitors and possibly the, the switch uh -huh. mosfet is rated for how much MOSFET, yeah, the MOSFET's rated for 60 volts. 60 volts, I see. Uh-huh. Um, are those MOSFETs, like, if, let's see, I mean, if we wanted to do, let's see, 30 amps max current, say you got 12, 24 volts, that's, that's pretty decent for now. And talking about scalability, like, if you do... Is it just replacing those those two things, or is would it be a lot of like would the driver be the same, or the driver changes too? I I don't think the driver would have to change. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe depending on the output voltage. Yeah, because I'm always thinking about okay, so we got uh, scalability is a big deal for us, of course. So what happens when you just put really fat components and use the same simple circuit? Can you get to, like, say you got, because this thing does say charging 24 volts, 30 amps max, um, 720 watts. That's good. What if you want to charge more? If you want to do, like, you know, just, you just need more power. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, I guess we'll do one thing at one step at a time. But when you when you're designing this, are you giving thought to like, okay, what what happens when I just use the fat, some fatter components? I mean, are they going to be way way more expensive, or it still will be uh, affordable? Because if the idea is that with a low increment in cost on the components, we could get significant increase in power, that would be worth doing. Because then, of course, they could still work for the lower powers, right? Yeah. Yeah, for the for the first prototype, I've mostly just been sorting by by cost, and if there those are are increases I can get without too much cost change, then I'll do it. But yeah, I haven't looked too much into it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So this is like thirty five parts for the thirty five bucks for the parts shown here. That's awesome. Um, let's see, what's the okay? Can you explain to me like this whole? Um, So we've got a little pot that controls the frequency. Is that what? What are we doing with the pot? Is that the voltage selection, or tell us a little more here? So that would select the duty cycle of the of the pulse, which translates to voltage output. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see. Is there like a little screen here that I saw somewhere? Yeah, seven, seven segment display that's not shown in this in the diagram right no um okay and let's see when you've got this uh high side gate driver there like that's what connects to the arduino outputs right no no it, the the arduino no. uh in this would only be connected it would be sensing the voltage at the output and then it would be connected only to the potentiometer and the the display of course uh-huh uh -huh. okay right right um do you have that documented anywhere else like um 
about the system system design? Not yet, no. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Um, what's your what's your schedule on on this? Like, uh, when would you think you could actually prototype this thing? Uh, it's kind of uncertain because I started school again, so I don't know how much time I'll have to put into it. But yeah, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Now, how much did you look into other things? Like, I put this instructable that I found. Like, did you look at other ways other people are doing it? Did you find any any compelling Arduino uh, DC DC converters? I'm not sure if it's Ar Arduino, but there is like an open source benchtop power supply, which is it, it's about I think I don't know two or three hundred watts. Yeah, that's not a lot. But some power for welders. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking we might be able to use some of the code, though. I haven't looked yeah. too much into it. But. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you do like so? You how how much of an exhaustive search for Arduino-based um, DC DC converters have you looked at, or were you looking more? more at the route of starting with raw components yeah i was looking more at the at the circuit level because the yeah it's it's pretty well abstracted from the whatever is controlling it like you could plug anything into this really uh explain that could plug it plug anything as oh. far as control signals like feedback and controls yeah, because you you have your like you have your voltage sensing output and you have your control of the potentiometer. Yeah, that could be done by any anything you want, really. Right, but conceptually speaking, like I, I think this is pretty cool. Um, that okay, so you're basically pul pulsing the the gate of a power handling element at whatever speed you like to change the voltage, and um, can you can you um, would it be easy for you to explain to the novice how this conversion converter works? Like, what's the role of the inductor and the capacitor? Or is that too hard to explain right now? Well, they they act to to as charge storage elements. So when the switch is on, the the inductor the current the current flows through the inductor. And so the inductor wants to keep whatever current is flowing in it flowing. So when you turn the switch off, it the current it will want want to keep current flowing in the same direction through it. But without this with the switch open, it won't be able to go back to the input. So the only way it'll be able to go is through the output. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's how it provides power to the output. Uh, but since you're pulsing the switch, it will be um, it will be kind of a yeah a pulse train. And so what the capacitors do is they just smooth that out to be a more constant DC level. Yeah, level. that's good. And there's um, in this circuit design, there's not really a limit. Like this basic design, pending of course some like heat dissipation like say you make this larger i always ask about larger here like because for us like the real interesting stuff gets into things like for example a welder right so if you scale the the capacitor the inductor and the and the transistor or make a bunch of those transistor happen like a bank of them so you can scale those transistors so you can even use the same one in multiple uh wouldn't this like one way to scale the circuit would be to simply use multiples of the same components. Would that work? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, you could maybe just make a bunch of these and connect them all in parallel. Yeah. Something like that. Um, possibly, as long as you can gui drive the gates, multiple gates, at the same time. Yeah, I guess depending on how you're doing it. Like if, if it, you were just connecting the outputs in parallel, I don't think it would matter if the the gates were in in uh, 
like synchronized because it should be just just like connecting some DC batteries together. Um, uh, yeah, possibly, but this since this is like a yeah, I have to look at that in more detail. Can a single gate driver drive multiple transistors, or it's like dedicated for one? It's powerful enough for one. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it would depend on how much current you can put out, and if that will uh, charge the gates fast enough for what you want. Yeah. Okay. But we know, like, uh, also, like, there's nothing a priori that says if we use bitter, bigger components that this kind of circuit, pretty much um, identical, wouldn't work with much larger power handling, right? Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah. yeah. We're kind of talking about a basic. For anyone who's kind of like, sees what's in there, it's relatively basic. Not like I have a clue of what's going on in there altogether, but <laughs> it's uh, not too, not too complex. Okay. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to get involved, who's watching this and prototyping this and make this into a scalable system, that's that's then put into an electrical 3D printed enclosure. Made into the real product, join the team. Okay, uh, moving on. So, uh, thank you, Miles. Do we have anyone else reporting today, please? That's good. Um, Ruslan is not here. Okay, sounds like we've got everybody. Now, Jen, um, regarding uh, any work on talking about the homeschoolers and getting 3D printers in their hands, uh, comments on that? Um, yeah, I haven't. I thought I had a, a spreadsheet that had some contact information for the different things. I'm actually kind of overwhelmed with the. Um, uh, I'm underwhelmed with the number of states that offer money, and I still haven't figured out how to get into the. Um, into the different like funding programs, you know, like, I guess I'd need to just start contacting people. Um, I think we need to put together something what do you need from me? figure out what the homeschoolers actually need. Uh, you're thinking they might need other things. Like for example, the maybe more important that they, that they get in their hands on some meaningful curriculum. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like clubs, where did I put my notes on that? Hopefully I put my notes in the right place. Um, crackers. Oh, oh, I know. I put it on, I put it on my page. So let me see if I can find it. So the, um, because some, some of the things that they pay for, like they'll pay for website access. So if we, we could have, we could have, I, mean, I don't know if we want to do that, but we could have like, but then that's not open source. Um, and they'll pay for clubs and they'll pay for ongoing, you know, for like ongoing access to teaching. Um, yeah. So I just, I just got, I just got like bogged down with other stuff and haven't really got into that. I need to start contacting the different, places is what I need to do so I can get some feedback and it was, about I, contacting the the funders themselves or yeah things. and I didn't want to do like obviously I didn't want to do that over Christmas right. and um oh, I thought okay. I put a page about it I thought I put up a page for my thing I, oh yeah here we go so um I guess I should just start emailing people I'll just make it a list to email a few people a day um I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick a link in that. Um, okay, so here is what I got started, and then this is the link to the Idea Programs Homeschooling page. One of their page. 
that talks about the different ways that allotment can be used and how much allotment there is. For example, there's 1900 a year for grades K through three, 2100 for grades four through eight, and 2400 for grades nine through 12. And the typical homeschooling family has three kids. A typical homeschooling family is going to have over $6,000 a year that they can spend on allotment. A lot of that's going to go, from my experience, a lot of that's going to go to hockey, space camp. There's a really good space camp on the Kenai Peninsula, for example. Alaska's got a lot of really good, interesting things. Um, so we'll pay. For, they'll pay for books, general homeschooling supplies, literature, social studies materials. I really think that um, OSE can integrate unit studies and like homes in in um, in social studies because because we are you know economics is social studies. Um, math manipulatives. I was thinking if we sold like 3d printer packages that included the programs for doing like different kinds of math manipulatives so like the older kids could be printing up stuff for the little kids to use and then they're fully recyclable or you can make your math manipulatives out of your recycled uh water bottles they'll pay for software in internet um, subscription boxes i don't know if there's any way we could do a subscription box electronic hardware they do pay for hardware now um educational toys and brain games curriculum packages and online subscription based programs are all things that I think that we could take advantage of somehow mm -hmm. ways that we could help the community and also generate some funding. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's what the idea homeschool program pays for. And I don't know if it's better. I don't know if it's better to start trying to break into like one really dialed in homeschooling program like that, or a really dialed in state like Alaska and then spread from there, like get some legs somewhere and then spread. Or if I should just start hitting everybody and hitting all the different programs. I mean, it's a really professional gig. It's not like we're trying to sell something that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not sure where to go. Like, for example, idea homeschool program. So that's, a, for example, Alaska funded and they give so much allotment to individuals who do homeschooling. And what does it take for the individual? They basically apply for that and are yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, absolutely. It? All you have to do is live in Alaska. They used to have a worldwide homeschool program because of so many military families there. But they, mm -hmm. I don't believe there's all, all um, still an idea international. So I think it's just idea. I think it's just Alaska now. Oh, interesting. So maybe like interesting to have a discussion with them and say, okay, here's what we we're working on. What what would be compelling? Get some feedback from them. What would be compelling for us to offer? Uh, oh, that's a good idea. Package. And and I still know some people that are there. So I would, um, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I know. I know someone I can contact about that. Yeah. 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 And to find out what what we can offer them. Be great. And, and I think it, it, it would be good because it would also give, like if somebody has a 3D printer and a circuit mill or, you know, different, it, it also gives them the opportunity to develop their own programs. I mean, I, I just, I'm just overflowing with the kinds of things. So. Yeah, I mean, like you talked about, oh, it can't be open source and like uh, can't be behind a paywall to be open source. Well, it actually can. We can, we can charge for education materials if we pr present uh, materials. It can be open source. You can still charge for it. Uh, that okay. just means that anyone can copy it still too, but that's that's oh, fine. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could, um, yeah, like maybe some education materials or, or something around like even putting together a curriculum to, okay, here's, uh, you know, say they have a 3D printer, but after they would have a 3D printer to do the, proto say the prototyping of the scale models and put a little package around that and some guidance around that or even classes around that for people who would find that compelling. I mean, I could, could, I could seriously see the brick press and the, and the um, tractor being yeah. really, really big there. I really could. I mean, because you know, my kids used to, all the kids, you know, they, they go outside and they build things. I mean, yeah. there's really not that much to do and we don't homeschool. So our kids can watch TV all day. You know, you boot their little butts outside and then they get to think of stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 But like and, thinking about like, say you have a tractor, kit or toy set mm -hmm. then instead of like you know people definitely get things from the store where they get some moving toy well we can actually be building that as part of a homeschool program or some kind of a yes program. yeah yes that would be that would be uh definitely useful so yeah it would take time to just uh all right i'll get that. Done. I, i've got a couple people that i still have emails for i'll get in touch yeah. and, and just put out and ask what we have, you know? Yeah. 
I just said, you know, November and December are bad times to contact homeschoolers, that's all. Right, right, right. Yeah, and since I'm taking a bit to the pen regarding the book, and, like, I will write about some of these ideas of just trying to flesh out some ideas of what we have in terms of resources and just making people aware of what we have and, and try and put together some mm -hmm. materials around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, sounds good. So... I think that's good for today's meeting. Uh, and Jen, so you'll save this and make sure. You, do you have to click anything for it to stop recording, or? Oh yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop the recording. Okay. Yep, yep. I'm glad it forced me to go into my Dropbox. I found all kinds of stuff. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thanks everybody. Then, so next meeting then next week, same time, 2 p.m. on Tuesday. So look forward to that. And I'll post this meeting up for anybody to watch this afterwards. So see you guys then next week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for coming.